have the distinct uh, privilege of introducing to you Dr. Edward J. Erler. Dr. Erler is a professor of political science at California State University, San Bernardino, and is a senior fellow of the Claremont Institute. He earned his BA from San Jose State University and his MA and PhD in government from Claremont Graduate School. He was a member of the California Advisory Commission on Civil Rights from 1988 to 2006, served on the California Constitutional Revision Commission in 1996, and has testified before the House Judiciary Committee on the issue of birthright citizenship. He is the author of The American Polity and co-author of The Founders on Citizenship and Immigration, which Dr. Bob just pointed out. I had the privilege of hearing Dr. Erler speak on the colorblindness of the Constitution last year at the Supreme Court CCA, and it was extremely informative. So again, I have the distinct honor and privilege to introduce to you Dr. Edward J. Erler. Thank you for that uh, nice introduction. Well, uh, today I think is a good day to talk about the Second Amendment, especially after hearing the President last night. And uh, I think everyone knows that we're engaged in a rather frantic debate about rights of gun owners. And I think uh, one example should suffice to prove that we are indeed engaged in a hysterical debate about gun ownership. One prominent, but I believe less than articulate member of Congress alleges that supporters of gun rights have become enablers of mass murder. To me, that is hysterical. And I think everyone knows that special animus has been directed at so-called assault rifles. And uh, I think you all know that these are not automatic weapons because they require a trigger pull for every round that is fired. Automatic uh, weapons have been illegal in the United States since the 1930s. Some of these uh, semi-automatic firearms can be fitted with large capacity magazines. But what probably inspires the ire of gun control advocates is the menacing look of these weapons. Somehow they don't appear fit for polite society. No a law-abiding citizen could possibly need such a weapon, we are told. They are designed for one purpose, to kill human beings. They surely are not designed for hunting. How many rounds from a high-powered weapon do you need to kill a deer? You've heard that many times. And we are assured these weapons are not well adapted for self-defense. Only the military and the police need such weapons. Senator Feinstein, probably heard her as well, confidently declaims that these weapons of mass destruction have no legitimate civilian use. But don't forget, we had an assault gun ban for 10 years, and it had no appreciable uh, impact on crime rates whatsoever. Now, over the past two decades or so, gun ownership has increased dramatically, at the same time that crime rates have decreased. The obvious lesson is that gun ownership is a deterrent to crime. But the progressives of all stripes deny such a simple correlation. Most gun crimes are committed with stolen or illegally purchased or illegally obtained weapons. What is the right formula to decrease crime? I think it's very simple. Increase the number of responsible gun owners and pro prosecute to the greatest extent possible under the law those who commit gun-related crimes or illegally possess weapons. It's a very simple formula. Now one interesting fact about gun violence is that 
assault rifles are rarely used by criminals. For one thing, they're not easily portable, nor are they easily um, concealed. In Chicago, you probably know this is the murder capital of the world, uh, excuse me, of the United States and perhaps the world. I've been to many dangerous places, but I'm very reluctant to go to Chicago. And you know they have uh, draconian gun laws in, in, in that city. Uh, but murders uh, are rarely committed by assault rifles there. Pistols are the weapons of choice, even for gang-related executions. And uh, probably some of you have, uh, have heard uh, the reports recently that it is safer to be deployed to a war zone in Afghanistan than it is to live in Chicago. Since we know that so-called assault rifles are not a significant factor in gun violence, apart from rare and spectacular events, does anyone doubt that the next target of progressive gun control will be the semi-automatic pistol? The same arguments apply. Why would any homeowner need such a powerful weapon? We are often told by experts that a gun in the home is more dangerous to the homeowner than to any intruder. And some people are simple-minded enough to believe that. Not anyone, I might add, who has taken a, an NRA certified course in handgun use. And by the way, Senator Feinstein, to the contrary notwithstanding, Assault rifles are superb home defense weapons. There is one uh, assault rifle that is not on the proposed uh, list of banned uh, weapons, the old M1 carbine of World War II vintage and Korean War vintage. It's a 30 caliber semi-automatic short barreled rifle that, hold, uh, that is capable of uh, taking a high capacity magazine. Uh, my apologies. President Obama is calling. <laughs> I hope there are no drones nearby. <laughs> this M1 carbine, I believe, is perfect for home defense. To say nothing of the AR-15, 223 caliber uh, assault rifle, uh, which is similarly uh, suitable for home defense, especially uh, with respect to a, a crime that has become becoming more and more popular with criminals, and that's the uh, home takeover uh, robberies and crimes, where several criminals uh, 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 rush the, the home or attack the home simultaneously. But, of course, we have this horrible spectacle of the mass shootings. We are told that we have to keep assault weapons with high capacity magazines out of the hands of people who are prone to commit such atrocities. And the only way to do that is to ban these weapons entirely. But who are these people? The recent shootings, Arizona, Colorado, Newtown, were per uh, per uh, perpetrated by mentally ill persons who, by all accounts, should have been incarcerated. Even the Los Angeles Times admits that there is a connection between mental illness and mass murder. The LA Times. But the same people, the same progressives, who advocate gun control also oppose the involuntary incarceration of mentally ill people who in the case of the recent mass shootings posed obvious dangers to society before they committed their horrendous acts of violence. From the point of view of the progressives who oppose involuntary incarceration of the mentally ill, and here you can thank the ACLU and like-minded organizations, It is better to disarm the entire population than to incarcerate a few mentally ill persons 
who are prone to engage in violent crimes. But we must not uh, forget that each of these shooters was also in possession of semi-automatic pistols. And I believe that the Arizona shooting of Congressman Giffords only involved a semi-automatic pistol. The same argument for banning assault rifles in order to keep them out of the hands of mentally ill or mentally unstable persons would then, by a parody of reasoning, apply to semi-automatic pistols, disarm the entire universe of law-abiding citizens who own semi-automatic pistols so that none of these weapons will fall into the hands of the dangerously, mental, uh, dangerously unstable. Does it make sense to deprive millions of law-abiding citizens of their constitutional freedoms so that a, free, that a few suffering from dangerous mental illness can remain free? Such is the logic of those who inhabit the world of progressivism. But we must be clear about one thing. As the president might say, let us be clear. The Second Amendment is not about assault weapons. It is not about hunting, and it's not about sport shooting. It is about something much more fundamental. It reaches to the heart of fundamental constitutional principles. It reaches to first principles. One favorite refrain of thoughtful political writers during the founding era held that a frequent recurrence to first principles was an indispensable means of preserving free government. And so it is. Let me, first of all, remind you of the text of the Second Amendment. I think you all know it, but it doesn't um, hurt to remind ourselves of the language of the Constitution. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. I think we all know the immediate impetus for, this, uh, for the amendment, and, it has never, and it, this has never been in dispute. Many of the revolutionary generation believed that standing armies were dangerous to liberty. Militias uh, made up of citizen soldiers, they uh, reasoned, were more suitable to the character of Republican government. Expressing a widely held view, Eldridge uh, Jerry remarked uh, in the debate over the first militia bill in 1789. Whenever government means to invade the rights and liberties of the people, he said, they always attempt to destroy the militia. Now, the Second Amendment is unique in that it, that it contains, it's unique among the amendments in the Bill of Rights in that it contains a preface or a prologue announcing the reason that a right is protected. Let me paraphrase. Since militias are necessary for the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms may not be infringed. Now here we have to read the words free state as a reference, not as a reference to the several states that make up the union. The frequent use of the um, phrase free state in the founding era makes it, I think, abundantly clear that the word state means here a non-tyrannical, a non-despotic, or perhaps even a non-monarchical state. Now Justice Scalia wrote the ma majority opinion in District of Columbia versus Heller, which was handed down in 2008, rightly remarked that the term free state and close variations seem to have been terms of art in the 18th century uh, political discourse, meaning a free country or a free polity. And here the, Justice Scalia was correct. Now, the, um, the principal constitutional debate leading uh, up to the decision in Heller centered around the question of whether the right to keep and bear arms was an individual right or a collective right. 
that is conditioned upon service in the militia. As a general matter, of course, the idea of collective rights was unknown to the framers of the Constitution. And it is this consideration alone that should have been decisive. We have James Madison's own testimony that the provisions of the Bill of Rights, as Madison said, relate, first of all, to private rights. And Madison did not indicate that the Second Amendment was an exception. Along with the other provisions of the Bill of Rights, it was meant to protect individual private rights. The notion that there, there are collective rights is wholly, I believe, an invention of the administrative state. And the founders of the administrative state, the progressives, were engaged in a self-conscious effort to supplant the principles of limited government that were embodied in the Constitution. The progressives argued that what Madison and other founders called the rights of human nature were merely a delusion characteristic of the 18th century. Science, they believed, has proven that there is no permanent human nature. There are only evolving social conditions, or what we might call today social constructions. For the progressives, what the founders called nature, or the rights of human nature, are either the epiphenomenal product of the historical dialectic, or simply self-willed delusions. Indeed, the, inherent, uh, the adherents of the administrative state came to regard the idea of individual rights as the enemy of collective welfare. After all, in the view of the progressives, the welfare of the community should always take precedence over the rights of individuals. The welfare of the people, not liberty, is the primary object of government. And government should always be in the hands of experts. This is the real origin of today's gun control hysteria. Professional police forces and military have rendered the armed citizen, so we are told, superfluous. We don't need armed citizens when we have police and professional military. No individual should be responsible for his own defense or the defense of his family. Leave it to the experts. The advent of the administrative state has rendered the idea of individual rights as well as the idea of individual responsibility unnecessary. In fact, incompatible with the progressive vision of the common welfare. Now, this way of thinking was wholly alien to the founders. For the founding generation, government existed for the purpose of securing individual rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it was always understood that a necessary component of every right was a correspondent individual responsibility. Madison frequently stated that all just and free government derives from social compact. All just and all free government derives from social compact. That's James Madison. And this is the very idea that is embodied in the Declaration of Independence, which notes that the just powers of government are derived from the consent of the governed. Social compact, to use Madison words, contemplates a certain number of individuals as meeting and agreeing to form one political society in order that the rights, the safety, and the interests of each may be under the safeguard of the whole. The compact, Madison duly notes, must result from the free consent of every individual. The rights to be protected by the political society are those natural rights that are the consequences of the first principles of human nature that all men are created equal. These rights exist by nature. They are not created by government, although governments are necessary to secure them. 
Thus, political society rightly understood, understood as Madison understood it, exists to secure the equal protection of the equal rights of all who consent to be governed. This is the original understanding of what we know today as the equal protection of the laws, the equal protection of equal rights. Now, each person who consents to become a member of civil society thus enjoys the equal protection of his own rights, while at the same time incurring the obligation to protect the rights of his fellow citizens. In this first instance, then, the people are a militia. The first appearance of the people and the idea of social compact is the people are a militia formed for the mutual protection of equal rights. This makes it impossible to mistake both the meaning and the vital importance of the Second Amendment. The whole people are the militia. And disarming the people dissolves their moral and political existence. Now, we remember that the preamble to the Constitution stipulates that we, the people, do ordain and establish this Constitution. And it's important to understand here is that the Constitution doesn't create the people. The people create the Constitution. Well, when did we become a people? I think that's simple. When we adopted those first principles by which we were to govern ourselves, the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence mentions the people in their political capacity. We are one people. And it mentions uh, uh, the people in their moral capacity. We are a good people. Once we become a people, then we establish the Constitution. And Madison says there was a second contract between the people and the government. The government is established to protect the safety and happiness of the people. And the people delegate powers to the government to be used for the benefit of the people for their uh, safety and happiness. Powers are delegated to the government, and the government can exercise only those powers and whatever powers are fairly uh, uh, implied from those specifically delegated powers. The government is to be a limited government, confined to the exercise of those delegated powers. We also remember that the Declaration of Independence specifies that when government becomes destructive of the ends for which it is established, again, the safety and happiness of the people, then, quoting the, the Declaration, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government. This is what has become known as the right of revolution. And this is an essential ingredient of social compact and a right which is always reserved to the people. The people can never cede or delegate this ultimate expression of sovereign power. Thus, a very, in, in a very important sense, the right of revolution, or even its threat, is the right that guarantees every other right. And if the people necessarily have the right of revolution as an indefeasible aspect of their sovereignty, then by necessity, the people have the right to the means to revolution. Only an armed people is a sovereign people. And only an armed people is a free people. The people are indeed a militia. But we must remember that the Declaration includes an important prudential lesson with respect to the, uh, to the right uh, to alter or abolish government. Prudence, the Declaration says, will dictate 
the government's long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. It is only after a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object, and that object evinces a design to reduce the people to absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Now, here the Declaration identifies the right of revolution not only as a right of the people, but as a duty. And I might add, it is the only duty that is mentioned in the Declaration of Independence. But again, the prudential lessons of the Declaration are no less important than its assertion of natural rights. The prospects of the dissolution of government, or the prospect, is almost too horrible to contemplate and must be approached with the utmost circumspection. As long as the courts are operating, free and fair elections are proceeding, and the ordinary processes of government hold out the prospect that whatever momentary inconveniences or dislocations the people experience can be corrected, then they should be tolerated. These do not represent a long train of abuses and usurpations. But we cannot remind ourselves too often of that oft repeated refrain of the founders. Rights and liberties are best secured when there is a frequent recurrence to first principles. Now, in the uh, District of Columbia versus Heller case, which was uh, again in 2008, the uh, Supreme Court handed down a decision that for the first time held unambiguously that the Second Amendment um, guaranteed an individual right to keep and bear arms for the purposes of self-defense. And in support of this uh, opinion for the court, um, Justice Scalia quoted Blackstone's co commentaries on the common law of England, or, uh, a work that was well known, of course, to the founders. Blackstone referred to the natural right of resistance and self-preservation, which necessarily entailed, he said, the right of having and using arms for self-preservation and defense. Natural rights, of course, are possessed by individuals. And one can easily see in Blackstone's language the rights of having and using arms a precursor to the Second Amendment, uh, which says the right of the people to keep and bear arms. And throughout his majority opinion, Justice Scalia rightly insisted that the Second Amendment recognized pre-existing rights, rights that were not created by the Constitution, nor in any way dependent upon the Constitution for their existence. But Justice Scalia, I believe, was wrong to imply that the Second Amendment rights were codified from the common law as part of what he called our venerable liberties. They were, in fact, natural rights, deriving their status from what the Declaration of Independence called the law of nature, laws of nature and nature's God. Now, in his uh, Heller dissent, Justice Stevens boldly asserted that there is no indication that the framers of the amendment intended to enshrine the common law right of self-defense in the Constitution. And now I think in a perverse way, Justice Stevens uh, was correct. The framers did not enshrine the common law of self-defense, rather they recognized the natural right of self-defense, a right that is possessed by every individual as well as the people. Like the natural right to revolution, the right to self-defense, the right to self-preservation can never be ceded to government or given up in any way. James Wilson, who was a signer of the Declaration of Independence as well as a member of the Constitutional Convention and later a member of the Supreme Court, uh, made this statement. The great natural law of self-preservation cannot be repealed or superseded 
or suspended by any human institution. But Justice Stevens nevertheless concluded that because there is no clause in the Constitution explicitly recognizing the common law right of self-defense, it simply is not a constitutional right and therefore cannot authorize the individual possession of weapons of self-defense. Remarkable. What Justice Stevens apparently doesn't realize is that the Constitution as a whole is a recognition of the great natural law of self-preservation, both for the people and for individuals. Whenever government is unwilling or unable to fulfill the ends for which it exists, the safety and happiness of the people, the, the right of action devolves upon the people, whether it is the right of revolution or an individual right to defend, to defend person and property. Now, Justice Scalia, in his majority opinion in Heller, uh, noted that those who argued for the collective rights uh, interpretation of the Second Amendment, including Justice Stevens in dissent, have the impossible task of showing that the rights protected by the Second Amendment are collective rights, whereas every other right protected by the Bill of Rights is an individual right. Why would the Second Amendment be an exception? Now, it is true that the Second Amendment states that the people have the right to keep and bear arms. Other amendments refer to the rights of the people. For example, the Fourth Amendment. Uh, the right of the people in the Fourth Amendment to, to be secure in their persons, homes, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. But there seems to be universal agreement that the Fourth Amendment rights belong to individuals, not to the people as an organic whole. It is the individual who has a right to be free from unreasonable government uh, intrusion. Similarly, the Ninth Amendment refers to the rights retained by the people. I believe this is also an obvious reference to individual rights. But what about the First Amendment's uh, protection of the rights of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Justice Stevens argued that these rights were in fact collective rights. Peaceable assembly and the right to petition. Collective rights. After all, he said, they contemplate collective actions. It is true, the justice conceded, that the right to assemble is an individual right, but its concern is with action engaged in by members of a group rather than by any single individual. And the right to petition government for redress of grievances is similarly, he says, a right that can be exercised by individuals even though it is primarily collective in nature. Its collective nature, the justice hope helpfully explains, means that if they are to be effective, petitions must involve groups of individuals acting in concert. Even though individuals may petition government for a redress, it is more effective if done in concert with others. Even though, the justice admitted, concert is not a necessary, is not necessary to the existence or the exercise of the right. Now, with respect to assembly, the justice argues there cannot be an assembly of one. An assembly is a collection of individual rights holders who can have, who, who have uh, united for common action or to promote a common cause. But who could argue that the manner in which the assemblage takes place or that the form that it takes significantly qualifies or limits the possession or exercise of the right. We might as well argue that freedom of speech is a collective right because freedom of speech is most effectively exercised when there is an, aud uh, an audience or uh, when there are auditors of some kind or another. Or that freedom of press is a collective right because it's most effectively exercised when there are readers. I can only conclude that Justice Stevens's argument is fanciful 
not to say frivolous. The argument for collective rights fails. Now, Justice Stevens also says that the preamble to the Second Amendment identifies the preservation of the militia as the amendment's purpose. Preservation of the militia. He would thus impose on the impos this impossible rendering upon the plain text of the amendment. Here's the way he would read the Second Amendment. Well-regulated militias being necessary to the security of the freedom of the several states, the right of the members of the militia in the several states to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. But I don't think the amendment says that or anything close to that. In order to reach this conclusion, Justice Stevens has to make, an, a, a, I think, a wholly incredible argument that the right to keep and bear arms refers not indeed to two rights, but only to one. Listen to this. The people have the right to keep arms only when they are actually bearing arms. Try to follow me here. It's not my argument. <laughs> and the people can only bear arms while in militia service. If these were two rights, the right to keep arms and the right to bear arms, then these, the right to keep arms might be interpreted to be a private right, even as the right to bear arms would be a collective right. Reduce the two rights to a single right, and you have one collective right that can be exercised only while serving in a militia. I think this argument is either frivolous or worse. Now, Justice Stevens' uh, contention also ignores the argument that was uh, prevailed at the founding, that the first appearance of the people, the whole people, is in its capacity as a militia dedicated to the equal protection of equal rights. Justice Stevens' view would allow government regulation, in effect, to create special militias, a subset of the people who have the right to keep arms only when they bear arms. The Second Amendment, however, sought to prevent the danger to liberty that would be posed by such special militias by properly defining the whole people as the militia. Now Madison knew, as well as Blackstone, how the Stuart Kings had used special militias to suppress liberty, particularly religious liberty. And a large part of Madison's purpose was to prevent the formation of special militias by emphatically defining the whole people as the militia. Because a militia is necessary to the security of a free state, the people shall not be disarmed. The court, however, in uh, the Heller decision, did indicate that there could be some reasonable restrictions on gun ownership. Justice Scalia wrote that long-standing prohibitions on the possession of firearms by felons and the mentally ill will uh, continue to meet uh, constitutional muster. Laws that forbid carrying firearms in sensitive places such as schools and government buildings are also reasonable regulations, as are conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of arms. The prohibition on dangerous and unusual weapons, including automatic firearms, fall outside the Second Amendment guarantee as well. But the Heller decision is clear that handgun possession for self-defense is absolutely protected by the Second Amendment. Can handguns be carried outside the home as part of the inherent right of self-defense? Clearly, the court indicated that handguns can be prohibited in sensitive places, but what about places that don't have the same sensitivity as schools and government buildings? Surely not every place outside the home is a sensitive area, and if carrying weapons in a non-sensitive area is protected by the Second Amendment, can there be restrictions on concealed carrying? These are all questions that will have to be worked out in the future, if not by 
legislation than by uh, extensive litigation. Uh, the Supreme Court um, took a further important step in securing Second Amendment rights in McDonald versus Chicago case uh, uh, that was handed down in 2010. Uh, here, the court ruled that the Second, Second Amendment rights, as articulated in the Heller case, were fundamental rights and thus binding on the states through the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. But here, I think uh, Justice Thomas, uh, in his concurring opinion, had a better argument uh, when he said that the framers of the 14th Amendment included, uh, intended to include all substantive rights, including Second Amendment rights, uh, to be contained in the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment. And I think his uh, opinion uh, had a more accurate uh, reading of the historical record uh, than uh, the, the four members that made up the, uh, four other members that made up the majority of the court. But uh, apparently the court has invested uh, too much effort uh, in its substantive, uh, substantive uh, due process jurisprudence to change, its mi uh, to change its mind at this late date. Now, uh, but we uh, must always keep in our mind that these two important decisions in Heller and McDonald were five to four decisions. Very close decisions. New appointments uh, of more, should we say, more progressive-minded uh, judges to the court uh, could easily bring about a reversal. For the moment, uh, Second Amendment rights seem safe, but in the long term, a political uh, uh, defense will be uh, a more effective strategy for those uh, who want uh, to defend Second Amendment rights. Uh, I think in the current climate of public opinion, um, Congress will probably have a very little appetite to pass for passing an assault gun ban uh, more likely, uh, Congress will be satisfied with passing legislation aimed at gun trafficking or perhaps tightening laws uh, about background checks. But we must remember that President Obama is famous for saying, if Congress won't act, then I will. He has already issued, uh, at my last count at least, 23 executive orders, some of them tightening background checks, others asking various executive agencies to launch gun safety programs, directing all relevant executive departments to maximize efforts to prevent gun violence and prosecute gun-related crimes and so on. This all seems to be fairly straightforward. Other executive orders are rather curious. One notes that there is nothing in the Affordable Care Act that prevents doctors from asking patients about guns in the home. Another directs the Centers for Disease Control to researching uh, the cause and prevention of gun violence. Now, there is no doubt that the president's power to act through executive orders is as extensive as it is ill-defined. Congress routinely delegates power to the executive branch and its agencies, and courts accord great deference to agency rulemaking powers. Uh, often uh, interpreting amb ambiguous legislative language or even legislative silence as a delegation of power to the executive branch. Now, delegation, um, of course, provokes fundamental questions of separation of powers, and even the rule of law. But many have argued that extensive delegation of legislative power to the executive branch is the price that we have to pay for the modern administrative state. Separation of powers and the rule of law as understood by the framers, we are told, has been rendered superfluous by the development of the modern state. Some of the boldest Supporters um, confidently tell us that the triumph of the administrative state has propelled us into a post-constitutional era where the Constitution no longer matters. I'm sure some of you have already gotten that feeling yourselves. 
The president already has the power under the Gun Control Act of 1968, some of you may remember that piece of legislation, he already has the power to ban the importation of assault rifles. The act gives the president the discretion to ban guns he deems not suitable for sporting purposes. Would the president be bold enough, or perhaps even reckless enough, to issue an executive order banning the domestic manufacture and sale of assault rifles? Perhaps he could argue that these weapons um, have no possible civilian use and should be uh, restricted to the military and that he, his power as commander in chief authorizes him to act. Or perhaps sometime in the near future, the president will receive a report from the Centers for Disease Control that gun violence has become a national health epidemic with a recommendation that the president declare a national health emergency. The president, by executive order, may then order the confiscation of all assault weapons. Congress surely could pass legislation to defeat the executive order, but could a divided Congress muster the votes? And in any case, the president could, uh, would veto the legislation. Surely we would have resort to the courts, but as of yet, we have no ruling that assault weapons are not one of the exceptions that can be banned or regulated under the Heller decision. We could make the case that assault rifles are useful for self-defense and home defense, but could we make the case that they are essential? Would the courts hold that the government had to demonstrate a compelling interest for the ban on assault rifles, as it almost certainly would have to do if handguns were at issue? All of these questions presuppose that the Heller decision is still standing, which it may not be. Are these simply wild speculations on my part? Perhaps, probably. But they are part of the duty we have as citizens to engage in a frequent recurrence to first, first principles. And I thank you for listening. <laughs> so I can uh, take some questions if anybody's interested. Uh, I think you have to take a microphone so we can record all of this for posterity or until tomorrow morning, whichever comes first. Uh, Stuart Reuter. Your discussion of the right of revolt raises, revolution. Revolution, raises the question of the legality of the Confederate States of America secession. Now, one, one interesting point, I, yeah, I receive a question like this all the time. One of the interesting things that uh, the South never did, or the Confederate States never did, they never justified uh, the secession on the basis of the right of revolution. Why? Because that is a natural right uh, argument, in, in which case they would have had uh, to somehow distinguish uh, uh, or argue around the fact that on the basis of natural rights, their slaves had a natural right to freedom. And so they knew better than to make a natural right argument for revolution as being the basis of <laughs> their secession. So they never argued that. Uh, yes, over, okay, oh, sorry. Can we go back to the, the preamble for the Second Amendment then, and make, make sure I understand your position? It sound, well, I infer said is that the preamble doesn't inform or constrain or otherwise affect the, the subsequent language of the Second Amendment. Is that the case? The amendment be the same, have the same meaning without? Um, difficult to say, but uh, I, I think that, uh, uh, that uh, it, it is unique in the sense that it is the only amendment that has a preamble or a prefatory uh, statement there. Uh, uh, the people have the, uh, the people's, uh, how would it read without uh, 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 the preamble to it? The, the people have the right to keep and bear arms. Well, uh, I think that uh, it, it would have the same meaning. Perhaps uh, we've been confused by the prefatory remark because. 
that, that we're not prone to extra rewards, but I think Madison wanted to make it clear. I mean, they were really important about this idea that militias were important and that I, I really do want to emphasize the idea that if Madison said, and he repeated this, I, I published an article a long time ago when I was a young professor, and you know, you have to have a lot of footnotes in your, in, in your writings, and so I counted up every time that Madison said, or made the statement that uh, all free uh, government and all just government proceeds from social compact, and it's many, many times, so it's just something that he said frequently, and we have to take it seriously. So that means that we, we all uh, consent to be governed, uh, and we all uh, uh, agree to protect one another's rights at the same time that our rights are being protected. Uh, and this means that the people uh, in this first uh, compact that is made are in effect a militia. That's how we become a people, is by becoming a militia pledged one to another to protect one another's rights. And so this is what Madison had in mind. Now, uh, Congress has the power under the Constitution to determine uh, the, the kind of training for militias and so on and so forth, so a well-regulated militia. And the first militia acts uh, defined the militia as everyone between the ages of, I forget, 18 and 45, or everyone who has uh, the capacity to serve in the militia, and, and so on and so forth. So in essence, the people are a militia, and they have, and no one who uh, is unwilling to serve in the militia or to protect the rights of other persons uh, has any right to be, uh, become uh, a part of the body politic. We can if we want to, uh, we are not obliged to, but we can if we want to grant conscientious uh, exemptions for people because of religion and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, there is no requirement that we do so based upon this uh, idea of social compact that Madison said was at the foundation of all uh, just and, and free government. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yes. Um, regarding, um, Senator Feinstein's um, ban. Uh, one of the things that's a little different, as I understand from the 1994 ban, is that owners, while they're grandfathered, if they own assault weapons, they're not allowed to either resell those weapons or hand them down to their heirs. That's correct. If that means to me that they are not allowed to recover their investment in that property, in that weapon. And isn't that a violation of the Fifth Amendment? No um, person shall be deprived of life, liberty, well, property without due process or the takings clause? Yeah, you could look at it that way. But of course, no one, uh, if you have uh, owned something that is illegal, <laughs> then of course you have no right to, uh, you know, no one has a right to inherit that property in any case. So the idea would be whether the government ha uh, can, by legislation, ban assault weapons or not. Uh, if it's legal to ban, uh, you know, to ban assault weapons, then of course uh, the idea of them being inherited and so on and so forth would follow in, in the wake of that decision as well. But that's just that's just legislation. If if uh, I have grandfather in California, you know, we have some pretty strict laws in California. I have, uh, um, actually, I, uh, I should have mentioned the M1 carbine, but uh, I, uh, it'll probably be on the list uh, tomorrow. Uh, uh, and, it, you know, I hope I didn't make a mistake there, but I have grandfathered weapons, but that's by legislation in California. Uh, and there is a proposal in California to... Uh, uh, to stop grandfathering uh, weapons that are already owned, and, and that uh, would be perfectly legal under the California uh, Constitution. So grandfathering is really delayed confiscation. Uh, you could look at it that way. Uh, if they, uh, uh, if uh, the California um, uh, uh, legislators uh, want to take the political heat for it, uh, then they could do that. Uh, you, we would, of course, get a, uh, a legal case right away and try to force the, uh, you know, the courts to uh, uh, decide otherwise. But who knows uh, uh, what the decisions would be? <laughs> Sir, how do you see the role of the local sheriff in the defense of the Second Amendment? <laughs> well, uh, it's been interesting. There's been a lot of uh, rumbling around the country. Uh, uh, some uh, sheriffs say they won't enforce uh, the assault gun ban. Uh, some sheriffs are saying uh, uh, to people that uh, you should arm yourselves, <laughs> don't depend upon the police anymore. And I, uh, I, I think that these are probably not good things for sheriffs to be saying, but I admire that kind of spirit. Uh, 
<laughs> in the country, and I'm glad to see that that kind of spirit in the country is still alive, and people are willing to say those kinds of things. But if it's a federal law, and uh, you know we have the supremacy clause in the Constitution, then uh, we have to obey the law. Uh, can we uh, count it as one of those uh, uh, pieces of usurpations that pursuing invariably the same end to reduce the people to absolute despotism? Maybe, uh, but uh, you know uh, this is going to be a difficult uh, thing. Some uh, sheriffs and police uh, uh, departments are welcoming uh, this ban, uh, um, and, and some uh, sheriffs and, and police are saying uh, the people should arm themselves. I think sheriffs and uh, you know police chiefs are, are political people. Uh, uh, and uh, they're most likely to be on the side of uh, disarming the people. But I can tell you that your ordinary policeman knows that an armed homeowner uh, helps the police. And I think any policeman will tell you, not any policeman, but most policemen will tell you something like that. And it really is true that an armed citizenry, that's what reduces crime. I mean, <laughs> look at Chicago. I mean, how can you argue against that? And it's not assault weapons that are uh, causing all the <laughs> violence in Chicago. I guarantee you that. Can you say a few words about where in the Constitution there's a basis for the ban on exotic or powerful weapons? Does the Constitution say we can't have nuclear weapons or? Weapons <laughs> or? Well. Uh, uh, when the court in the uh, D.C. case says, uh, you know, unusual or dangerous weapons, uh, I, I think that this is a reasonable thing. Look, we, uh, the Constitution says uh, Congress shall make no law uh, uh, um, respecting uh, an establishment of religion or, you know, interfering in the free exercise of religion. But if you have a religion that requires you to, uh, to make human sacrifices, uh, I think it's reasonable to say that uh, you can believe in human sacrifice, you just can't do it. Uh, or that freedom of speech doesn't allow you to libel or slander. Uh, because uh, civil society, you know, uh, libel is a, is, is a way of taking a person's property because your reputation is your property. So libel is, a, is taking a person's property without due process of law. So we have these reasonable restrictions and regulations. Uh, automatic weapons, we could have an argument about that, whether or not they are dangerous or unusual weapons. Probably, you know, I have many, many years ago uh, 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 military experience, and, and my weapon when I was in the Army was an M60 machine gun. I love that weapon, and I wish I had one now. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but I don't think that every uh, uh, armed citizen should have an M60 machine gun. You don't have to have a lot of training to uh, fire them. Uh, and to handle them uh, properly and so on and so forth. Uh, should everyone uh, have a grenade launcher? I don't think so, probably not. Flamethrower, probably not. Uh, you know, uh, an Abrams tank, probably not, although I wish I had one of those too, but uh, make driving on the freeway in California a lot easier. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, so uh, we can have an argument about reasonable restrictions uh, uh, for gun ownership. I do not think that assault rifles, and I, I hate to use that term, but it's in common parlance now, but assault rifles I do not think are, are, are the weapons that, uh, 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 that should, be, should be banned or restricted. I mean, when people say they're no good for any kind of civilian use, that's simply not true. Get yourself an M1 carbine and, and, and get back to me and tell me uh, that that thing is not useful. Uh, it is. Well, but but that's the way it all. Yeah, it, that, but that's the way. No, you're you're right. That but that's all the way it always is. We have to make judgments about these things. What kind of speech should be allowed? You know, clear and present danger. This is a standard for speech. Are we going to allow people to, uh, uh, you know, falsely yell uh, fire in a crowded theater? That's the example that's always used. Of course, we can restrict that speech. But the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law. But we can't have uh, people saying uh, uh, you know, anything uh, they want to at any time, in any place, and so on. So time, place, and manner restrictions upon speech, those are reasonable regulations. And so uh, everything uh, can be subjected to that. And of course, we have to make judgments. We have to make decisions about things. That's why we have legislators who are supposed to deliberate about things. 
Uh, they don't often deliberate very well. We have courts that are supposed to deliberate. Look how long it took. I didn't think that I would live long enough to see a Supreme Court decision saying that Second Amendment rights were individual rights. You know, I actually prayed for, for that for years and years and years. And then we finally got it in 2008. I never thought we would see it. Uh, uh, I don't know how many years it's going to, uh, that decision is going to stand. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, we finally got it. So that was significant progress. Uh, but, uh, so now we have to make a decision. Uh, somebody's going to come along, and I think uh, if Senator Feinstein gets her way on assault rifles, somebody's going to come along and say, well, wait a minute. The Supreme Court case said, uh, and Heller said, that handguns are the weapons of choice for the homeowner. Does that mean a semi-automatic uh, uh, handgun? You know, who needs a 45 uh, semi-automatic pistol? I mean, that's a powerful weapon. The homeowner doesn't need that. I mean, why can't we go back to uh, p black powder uh, pistols or something like that? And so, you know, we've got to make decisions. And, uh, and that's what we have to do always. And so, uh, free exercise of religion. We can't let people do whatever they want to. Uh, and the Supreme Court said in the um, case in, uh, I think it was around 1880, uh, if uh, we allowed a, a, a free exercise exemption based upon everybody's view of what was proper to his religion, everyone could become a law unto himself. Because you could say, my religion doesn't allow me to obey that law. So everyone would become a law unto himself. So we have to have uh, all kinds of regulations and reasonable restrictions upon what can be allowed under the guise of free exercise of religion. No cannibalism, no human sacrifice, and so on and so forth. <laughs> so, and I suspect the, the same thing is, is uh, of true of uh, gun ownership as well. And so uh, we'll have all kinds of arguments. And I think we ought to draw the line on assault, uh, assault rifles. We ought to stop calling them assault rifles for one thing, but uh, 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 we ought to draw the line there. I don't think that they should be banned, although I, uh, I'm not too concerned about people owning automatic weapons or mortars. I'd like to have a mortar too. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs>